Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for coming. So I'm Dan Sperling. I'm a professor at, at University of California, Davis, director of the Institute of Transportation Studies there. And I do have this moonlighting job as a board member for the California Air Resources Board, which actually is relevant here in many ways. But it's also relevant in the, from the perspective of what we're trying to do here is bring science to policy, in bring universities closer to government, support government decision making, and industry as well. So we're holding this, this event is the fourth in a series by the Institutes of Transportation Studies at UC. So the first one, not the first one, but there's, there was one by Berkeley, UCLA, Irvine, and, and now us, we're the fourth one. How many have gone to at least one of the others? All right, okay, and you're back, so that's a good sign. <laughs> and, and actually it's important because we are thinking that it has been so successful and we have been getting such good feedback that we are going to continue this uh, you know, as essentially a permanent uh, event. Not every week, but we'll probably start it up again in the fall and do this intermittently uh, into the foreseeable future, as long as you keep coming and uh, we'll keep doing it. So this all came about because the state provided some additional funding to the ITS. So until very recently, the ITSs, the four of them that I just mentioned, have been, we've been very successful. Together, we're c clearly the number one uh, transportation research center in the U.S. and in the, wor in the world. Uh, without any without any qualification, um, and so, but the thing is, I, people like that without any qualification, right? No disclaimers. <laughs> but we came, we developed a lot of expertise. We've trained a lot of students. We do a lot of research. We got great people, but we weren't being able to be really responsive to the needs of the state. And here we are in California. Yes, we're doing a lot of fund, funded project for Caltrans and Air Resources Board, Energy Commission and others. But at the end of the day, that issues come up and there's a, a request for us to be responsive. And we didn't have, we weren't able to be responsive because everyone was on grants and contracts and everyone's committed. So this funding freed us up to provide to be much more responsive. And so we've generated a whole series of projects uh, that are in the policy briefs from those are gonna be available soon. The, re the reports will be available. We've been interfacing very closely with, with, with uh, many of the state agencies. Every project has a champion in an in a agency, either a state agency or a regional agency. So we're very excited about this, and this is the beginning of a process where we will be able to be much more responsive. And so if you work in the legislature or some of the agencies, you know, please be aware of this. You know, we are going to be, uh, we're going to develop a rapid response team that will be able to respond in a shorter term to with memos or policy briefs on issues as we go along. So this is the fourth, as I said. It's the last but not the least, and we're and, and I should say this is being videotaped, and it'll be available soon. I think the first one four weeks ago is just going to be posted today or tomorrow, so there's a little lag, but it will be available, be archived. Um, the last session, led by UCLA, focused on transit. And they address the question, why is transit declining? Or at least why is ridership declining uh, uh, overall, uh, given all the investment that's being made? And they, they came up with one hypothesis that seemed pretty compelling, that what's happening is that immigrants who have played a big role in ridership, they are getting cars sooner, they are getting cars uh, more quickly when they're here, and they, after they're here, they're, get, they're purchasing cars and using cars. And because transit, at the end of the day, is a relatively small part of the total uh, travel, that can have a big effect. And I say that because the end conclusion of that is, 
we really, transit is really important to serve those that don't have access to cars. But it has a, a bigger role too, another role, and that is dealing with our, our whole transportation system. And it provides, it takes people out of cars. But if we're only at one or two percent, it's not taking a lot of people out of car. That's you know one or two percent of passenger miles travel. So what we're here today to talk about is broadening that view of transportation and thinking about new opportunities. So I've been in working in the transportation world for decades. Let me tell you, there's been almost no innovation in transportation. It's been kind of disappointing, actually. But now, we're seeing so much innovation. You know, for years, if you think about it in a systems context, our roads have barely changed, our cars are higher quality, but they're functionally the same, four wheels, same capacity, same speed, same fuels. And so now we, we've got what we're calling these three revolutions. Electrification, sharing, the shared mobility, the sharing economy, and automation. And these, for those of us in transportation, this is just stunning and exciting. And it should be for all of us because it's providing opportunities for making our transportation system much more efficient, more sustainable, more equitable, and less costly, less infrastructure, less congestion. So we have, uh, and so I said one more thing um, before we get started I want to say is that at UC Davis, we've specifically created a, a forum. Uh, we call it Policies for the Three Revolutions. And we started it with an ev a big conference last fall. And we're using that as a platform, and a platform to communicate and provide information. We're going to convene workshops. We'll have webinars, policy briefs. And so that form that you had uh, picked up in the other room, please sign it and provide your email address and if you're interested, no coercion, uh, and, and we'll make you part of that. And that will be extended to the other camp, we'll be working with other campuses, other researchers, local government, and others. All right, so today we have three fabulous people to speak to you. We're going to I say fabulous, it reminds me of someone else. Um, <laughs> Um, so, first we're going to have Professor Joan Walker from UC Berkeley, and she's an expert on travel behavior and has been working in, with these three revolutions, and she's going, to <clears throat> she's going to give us an introduction to it. After that, we're going to have Susie Pike. She's a researcher at UC Davis and an expert on the policy and behavior also, but we're focus, going to focus a little bit more on policy. And then we're going to say, okay. Uh, all of this great research, all of these great university insights are, are good. Now we need a real world reckoning. And Hassan Akrata couldn't be a better person to do that. He's been executive director at the Southern California Association of Governments for 10 years. Um, insightful, thoughtful, creative, innovative, and real world. So let me turn it over to Joan. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dan, for the invitation, and Molly for all the organizing. And so I'm going to talk about this future of autonomous vehicles. And what I want you to do is go with me on a journey. Let's try to think about the future. Think about, I don't know, 5, 10, 20 years out when we have level 5 autonomous vehicles, when the people do not have to be in the car. The cars can be sent on their own. I'm a travel behavior researcher. To me, that's the most interesting uh, angle on the game. So let's think about what that's going to look like. And my key message to the talk is that we do have various futures. We want to think about the future we want to get to. And we need to start thinking today about how to follow that path and get where we want to be. So if you go out into, and partly what I'm going to do, the start of my talk is really looking at what I see people talking about this future. And then from a travel behavior researcher perspective, how I see what these, uh, these statements that are being made. So if you Google autonomous vehicles, or if you go to an autonomous vehicle uh, conference, the technology people building these, you see pictures like this. So I would call this vision of the future version one. And what do you see here? You see free flowing traffic. You see this, um, 
this kind of concept of safety and these yellow bars, you see a person in the vehicle behaving exactly as they should, alert, hands on their, uh, their lap. And so what I would say is, is this a realistic future? You know, are, and I hear this again and again, autonomous vehicles are gonna solve all of our transportation problems, right? This is, this is the thing we've been looking for. And what I would say is, well, this is the current reality, right? I mean, we're stuck in this traffic all the time. The major cities in California, this is what Google says is the typical rush hour traffic in these cities. If you're leaving Sacramento today at rush hour, this is what you'll likely face. And in terms of the future reality, so there's no question automation will improve efficiency. There will be more capacity. It will improve safety. These are great things. But I would say not enough to relieve congestion. And why is that? Well, there are these opposing trends. There's increasing population. There's increasing urbanization. There's increasing vehicle miles traveled per capita. And this is just, we've known this for a long time. As we build capacity, what happens? All together now. I mean, latent demand, right? That the capacity gets filled up. And so, and people have crunched these numbers and basically have come up with the conclusion that um, even under the most optimistic technology scenarios, we do need behavior change in order to deal with our transportation and congestion problem. And so then people say, aha, behavior change, but we have it, we have it coming. A vision of the future version two. The Lyft president says that car ownership will all but end in cities by 2025. There was a recent study out of the Rocky Mountain Institute that said a similar thing. This idea of people aren't gonna own cars anymore and that's gonna now solve our problem. We're gonna have the shared system, shared vehicles. So let's look at this assumption. The, um, if you look at these, these calculations, they're often based on cost, okay? So let's look at the cost assumption. One thing is, is that People aren't rational. People do not consider their full costs when you make trips in your car. You're considering just a portion of that. Um, and then the other thing is, so how many of you own a car? And how many of you own the cheapest car that meets your mobility needs? Yeah, in this crowd, there's a decent number of people. By the way, this year, it's a 13,000 car from Nissan, $13,000 car from Nissan. But so it's just because it's gonna be cheaper doesn't mean that people are gonna to flock to this. More people will. I do agree that it does give people a viable alternative to owning your own car. And because of that, we will have more people um, not owning their own car. But to say it's naturally just because of costs going to move there, I don't think that's the case. The other argument that comes up is convenience. Oh, the millennials, we just love calling up an Uber and Lyft. And why do you need to own a car? You can just call your own car. It's so convenient. It's so wonderful. Well, imagine if you have an autonomous vehicle of your own, that's pretty darn convenient. You call your own car. It's like, you know, it, it's just like Uber and Lyft, but it's your own personal car in space, and it's your image, and it has your stuff in it, and your smells in it. You know, that the, I would say, owning your own personal car, and it can take itself to the garage. It can, you can send it on errands. You can, you know, have, send your parents to the doctor in it. It, that having your own autonomous vehicle would be just as convenient. Then the other argument is flexibility, the idea that you can have, um, if you want, it's a sunny California weekend, you want a convertible, you can get a convertible, you're going up to the mountains, you can get an SUV, and that's true. So that's the one, that's the one thing I would give this future of shared is that you would have more flexibility in different cars. Um, so, but then in terms of behavior change, whether or not people have their own vehicle, let's say we do go to the shared, um, the shared vehicle route. And this is the picture on the cover of the Rocky Mountain Institute, and this is another audience participation moment. And so, what I want you to do is try to imagine this future. This is a shared vehicle that you'll be using. You can close your eyes, it helps you imagine it more, but I want you to think about a trip you're making. I want you to think about where you're going. I want you to think about who you're with, what, uh, what you're doing. Everyone have that image in their mind? Yeah, I don't even see any nods, but I'm sure you're with me, thank you. Um, so what I would ask is how many of you were with a stranger? How many of you were riding to a transit station? A few. So in this crowd, I mean, and this is our audience, right? This is the crowd that's looking for this future of shared mobility and shared rides. And even you guys aren't really imagining that. So, you know, the bottom line is that, and this is an old famous picture showing that, you know, it's more efficient to move 100 people by bus or by bike than it is by car. Putting a single people, person in a vehicle is a very inefficient way to move people. And then John Orcutt pointed out that 
you know, car and Uber and autonomous car doesn't change this equation at all. If we still have a single person, I'm glad you guys still laugh. I feel like this picture's been out for a while that it's getting a little bit old, but you know, it's really powerful. If we still have a single person in a single vehicle, it doesn't matter whether it's shared or not. Um, it still has that inefficiency that we're dealing with now. Um, okay, so vision of the future version three. So, you know, what I would say is we have this autonomous coming, but we, we need all these other things. We need it to be clean. This is the three revolutions. We need it to be clean. We also need it to be connected in order to have the capacity efficiency improvements. We need these vehicles talking to each other. We need people not only to share rides, but to share vehicles. We want right size vehicles so that the vehicle um, is the correct size for the purpose that's being used. We want it to be equitable, well, that's an issue. And then priced, I put priced here because I don't see a future where we can get here without better pricing of our system. So I've learned recently we need to have a nice acronym. So I plugged into an anagram, PACERS. Okay, this is my acronym. It's all the things we saw before. Any PACERS fans, sorry. Um, but that's not a very good picture. There's a PACERS car, maybe that. <laughs> Pacer's bike, there's a bike. But actually, this is the image that I think fits the um, a pacer of a marathon, the person who makes sure that we're on a steady pace that will get us to the finish line. So I think this is what we want to think of. This is the finish line we're trying to get to. Let's figure out how we can get there. So let me switch gears a little bit to the, um, let's see, how am I doing on time? Ah, OK. <laughs> um, let me switch gears to travel behavior a little bit. So. The, so a, a big question is, how is travel going to change in the future? Here's New Yorker using Uber as a verb, but um, you know this school kid saying, hang on, I'll Uber us a school bus. So the question is, how is travel going to be changed? And it's really, it's hard to answer that question now because these things don't exist. And we need to be able to project people somehow into this future environment um, in a way that could be very different. So, but there is this rich transportation behavior literature we'll, we're building on. There are various approaches people are using to try to answer these questions of how travel will be different. There is some work out now, um, and here are just some of the findings that certainly we can drastically reduce the vehicle fleet if we do have a shared vehicle fleet. Most of our cars are sitting around most of the time, and so we can, if everyone shares vehicles, we can get by with a lot fewer vehicles. Uh, it may not help on congestion, but what that does help is the parking, right? We have all sorts of space from parking freed up. That's a great thing, certainly, for urban environments. But all studies basically say vehicle miles traveled increase. And so these are actually pretty naive assumptions, not, I would say, not very behavioral, very useful in terms of trying to um, tease out what these future VMT increases will be. And then the other thing people are looking at willingness to pay, and people are willing to pay for these automated vehicles, 5,000 on the average, zero to 10,000. This seems to be a pretty consistent result. And this is also on the order of what people think these, the extra technology will cost. It's not going to be something where only Uber and Lyft and firms like that can afford these vehicles. It's actually going to be in the range where people can afford them. Um, so, but I would say there are still these very critical travel behavior research questions. So there's um, a strong sense that the VMT per person will increase. The question is how much. Larger proportion of people won't own cars. The question is how much larger. Higher proportion of trips will be shared rides. Because one of the things that the shared mobility is it enables shared rides, right, in a way that we don't have now or it's coming on board now. Vehicles will change size. Will they be smaller or larger? I, I'm not dealing with freight very much, but I think we should address freight. So, But on-demand delivery is escalating. Anyone have these Amazon buttons? You press a button, a bottle of detergent comes to your door. Pretty inefficient, I would say. But you know what will this do to traffic? And so, oh, and also drones. I think we need to worry about drones. Actually, the flying car was just all over the news the other day, right? We have to worry about flying cars, too. So, but all of this, you know, the question is, as we, these levers are changed, what happens to congestion? And clearly, we want this bottom picture. And this bottom picture, to get there, we need all these things to move in certain directions. You know, VMT will increase. Well, we want it to increase a um, lower amount. We want more people not to own cars. We want more shared rides to be shared and so forth. And so, in terms of getting to this few, oh, let me talk about one more thing, equity. Uh, so let me talk just quickly about equity in autonomous vehicles. It's a really important issue. On one hand, it may be great. We have new mobility for people that didn't have it before, the elderly, the disabled, the young. It uh, will lower the cost for high quality transportation services that we 
don't have today. There's a real potential to reinvent transit. But on the other side, there's a potential downward spiral of public transportation services. Public uh, private firms are coming in, and they aren't taking the, um, you know, the poor riders and the hard to serve areas. They're taking the profitable lines and uh, and things. So we could have this downward spiral. And then if you look at private transportation services, the equity record, you know, are they serving all neighborhoods, all demographic groups, all physical abilities, all levels of credit status, all levels of technological assets? No, they're not. And why would we expect them to? I mean, we have to realize they are private agencies. This is where the public se sector has to step in. And then. Pricing, which I would say needs to be a part of the equation, there's a strong equity issue here, but also it generates a lot of revenues. These revenues can be used to deal with equity, to target equity issues. Okay, so in terms of um, the conclusion, planning for the future, so I would say, you know, I think it's pretty clear we want this version three, and what I, I think what concerns me is when I hear people say, well, clearly we're gonna go there. No one, the millennials, they don't wanna own car. I look at the behavior, I don't see it. I think with status quo, I don't think it's likely we'll get to version three. And so I would say don't be naive about behavior. It's dangerous to underestimate the attachment to one's own car. You know, all signs lead to significantly more vehicles and miles traveled. Public sector must intervene to for equity. The other thing is to be proactive, not reactive. So once habits are formed, they're really hard to change. And we have a new, we have this new transportation system coming in. We have new habits being formed and we need to worry about these habits now. Um, once items are free, it's really hard to charge. So we need to start thinking about charging them, charging for things before people get used to them being free. Social norms are also really powerful. We need to think about how to play out on the social norms. And so to get to this future version three, it does require strong incentives and disincentives towards sharing vehicles and sharing rides, towards right size, clean, connected vehicles. Zero occupancy vehicles, you know, I feel like my whole career was worried about single occupancy vehicles and how bad they were. You know, now we have zero. They don't exist now, let's price them. You know, let's price them so that when they start be getting out on the road, we have a mechanism we can work with. I think we need to worry about freight and on-demand economy. We also need to worry about the third dimension, drones and flying cars. And so what I would say is this pay search. You know, we need a slow and steady push to this version three. And I think if we don't worry about it today, my concern is we're not going to get there. So let's figure out how to get there. Thank you very much. So that, so that set the stage very well, that what we need is a better understanding of behavior to understand who is going to be willing to share or give up ownership and under what circumstances, and then we need policy to intervene. So more than ever in the, in, in, since World War II, we really need the policy world being engaged here. And so next we have Dr. Susie Pike to follow up on that idea. Okay, so Joan set everything up for me very well and started to kind of indicate what sort of goals we might want to pursue and even some of the policy avenues for those goals. So I'm going to dive in a little bit deeper into a few of the different policy avenues that we might consider to address um, some of the sustainable transportation goals that we might have related to these new technologies and the three revolutions um, as well as to address some of the other issues like equity that we're also thinking about. So just to remind us, we're thinking about this triple revolution. So we're thinking of automated vehicles, electrification of vehicles, and then the shared use mobility. And what I'm most interested in is understanding how these new technologies and innovations can be integrated with the goals that we already have in terms of sustainable transportation and what kinds of policies we need to, to move forward on those goals given this new and evolving environment that we're seeing in transportation. I'm a little bit optimistic maybe. We have this um, good, this opportunity now to really think about what kinds of policies we need to put in place because we're talking about time horizons that are a little bit um, in some estimates far off in the future, although some say that there's more urgency needed than others. Um, and as uh, Joan mentioned, there's a growing body of research related to 
a whole variety of things. So how people are going to adjust their behavior and use these new technologies. There's research estimating the greenhouse gas emissions changes if different proportions of the fleet are autonomous or different proportions of the fleets are shared. But so far, there's little policy. So um, this figure shows to date, um, about a week ago, the states in the country that have adopted autonomous vehicle policy. And most of the policies that have been adopted thus far are related to um, maybe this sort of first round of issues that are being addressed. So things like safety, liability, um, how these vehicles should be tested on the roadways and what kinds of permitting is required associated with that. Um, but if our interest is in sustainable transportation, then we want to also be thinking about, well, what kinds of policies do we need to be introducing that go beyond these topics and move us into addressing some of the other issues like um, increased VMT or equity challenges? Okay. And then if we think about the local level, we see even less activity. So one recent uh, publication talks about um, how local planners are thinking about autonomous vehicles. And they don't really want to do very much at all because there's so much uncertainty about what's going to happen and because it doesn't fit into their routine activities that they need to work on as local transportation planners. So there's very limited activity. On the other hand, there's a lot of excitement around shared mobility, including both car sharing and ride sharing or ride hailing. But Mostly that's taking the form of sustainable community strategies or general plan actions, which may or may not have a lot of teeth behind them and a lot of weight in terms of requiring people to do things or requiring cities to do things. So we're still kind of at this um, point where we're not seeing a lot of activity related to how these new technologies can um, be shaped to help meet sustainable transportation goals. So these goals are not necessarily only for shared use mobility, but also for all three of the revolutions that we're talking about. Um, and Joan kind of identified some of these, but I <clears throat> would say that some of the things that we really want to be thinking about are increasing the vehicle occupancy, um, improving multimodal connections in a variety of ways, improved and equitable access, um, incorporating higher levels of electric and low emission vehicles, and trying to maybe shift auto ownership towards this shared model. So that's a lot of the behavior change that we we'll want to think about. And then some of the tools that we might use to think about evaluating different policies that I'll go through are what are the costs and benefits? Who is benefiting? What's the distribution of those outcomes? Are they feasible? There are some things that I thought a year ago might be great policies, but you know, um, like requiring all autonomous vehicles to be in shared use. But we've sort of missed the boat on that kind of thing, and it's not feasible anymore. Although there might be other ways to incentivize shared use autonomous vehicles. Um, but then, of course, logistics. And when we think about the policies themselves, we want to make sure that we're getting things right, like the level of incentives, um, that the scales are suitable for the targets that we're trying to reach, and that who, who is targeted by the policy is the right person or the right entity. All right. So one of the challenges that we think about with autonomous vehicles and also with some of the um, ride hailing is the improved and equitable access challenge. So is everyone going to be able to use these services? And are there going to be limitations? So two or three um, important policy goals and possible avenues include ensuring fair geographic coverage. And as Joan pointed out, these are private um, interests, right? private companies that are running these services. So it's challenging to dictate where and who should be um, able to access these uh, services. But some of the other things that the industry is doing themselves, and we might be able to kind of build on with good policy, is ensuring payment options for the disadvantaged. So this is an example of a little card that you can get through Uber, 
where you prepay for your ride. So you don't have to have a credit card ahead of time in order to be able to sign up and use the service, you can prepay. So maybe that's an option that should be mandated for these kinds of services as they're coming, as they're coming around. It's something the industry is already doing and something that we could require more of. The same thing for internet and telephone scheduling. So not only um, does this enable people who might not have a smartphone or app um, the ability to use their smartphone, it enables someone, so it enables someone else to, to schedule a ride for you. And so these, these kinds of requirements might enable more of the users who don't just have access because they're a millennial with a smartphone. It can help to improve the access for everybody. So again, requiring these kinds of features to be part of the services might be um, a fairly accessible policy avenue to address some of the equity problems. Okay. Um, so then another avenue that we'd like to pursue is um, incentivizing autonomous vehicles to both be shared and to be low emission vehicles. So going from this chain of, um, I think these are Google cars, right, to multiple passengers in one vehicle. Um, and so there's a variety of ways that we could achieve this. Some of the, some of the avenues that I've been thinking about are um, rebates for uh, automated vehicles that are put into shared use. So if they're bought by a shared use fleet to have some kind of rebate uh, maybe extra ZEV credits for electric automated vehicles, um, reduced fees for the use of public infrastructure, so pick up and drop off for, for vehicles that are used in shared fleets as opposed to ones that are owned at the individual level. Um, and then for the um, shared vehicles, one of the, th one of the things that's been happening a little bit are these specialized car rental services, and so maybe finding ways to promote these car rental services that really focus on low emission vehicles for the shared use travel. Okay, so one of the challenges though that comes along with this, oh, my slides are not in the order I thought, um, is that how do we increase vehicle occupancy? So um, for me, this is one of the more challenging policies, but seems like one of the ones that could potentially have a, great, a greater benefit because the more people we can get into shared use trips, right? So we're not just talking about a vehicle that's used by multiple people, but we're talking about this idea of a ride actually being pooled. So Joan asked us to imagine a trip and whether or not we were have encountering strangers in that trip, right? And ideally, we would want a lot more of these rides to be rides that are pooled where we're not just traveling with people that we know. Okay, so then one last uh, policy avenue that I wanted to mention is um, related to multimodal connections. And for me now, as I've thought about this more, this has um, come to be a lot about data sharing. We've seen a whole bunch of these small-scale pilot projects across the U.S. that have integrated different parts of shared use mobility with transit operations. And even here in Sacramento, we have the RT station link, which um, works with Uber, Lyft, and the local um, yellow cab. But I've learned that it's very difficult for the transit agencies to share what they're learning and even maybe to learn a lot from these pilots because they don't have a good access to the data. And so who, who's uh, learning from these pilot projects? Probably the industry. And so if we could have a better policy related to data sharing, especially for things like this when there is public funding involved, um, to me, this seems like an important piece of moving the policy to the next stage. So if we want to see these kind of pilots expand and we want to see them um, scaled up within the locations that they've been introduced, we really need to work on this um, data sharing so that we can evaluate them. Okay? Um, all right. So that's what I have. I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to turn it back over to Dan. So I think you're starting to get the sense of what we need to be thinking about going forward. You know, higher load factors in the vehicles, but there's all the behavioral issues. You know, are you really willing to sit in a car with a stranger? 
I mean, you know, we do sit in airplanes, and it's not completely uh, alien experience. Um, are we willing to give up ownership of vehicles because we need these providers to be utilizing these vehicles more efficiently and, uh, and picking up more, vehicle, more people? And if we do create those choices, then as we have more choice, we move away from this model we have now of a single occupant vehicle. So much of our travel, single occupant vehicles. Joan illustrated that so well in that one slide she had. We need to move away from that because we're gonna just be stifled, paralyzed, and high costs and congestion and pollution and so on. So to take all these ideas, and bring them into the real world because there are a lot of these partnerships are ha starting to happen between transit and private providers. And there's some, you know, a lot, you know, the Uber pool and Lyft line are here, not in Sacramento, coming soon, I hope. Uh, but that is where we're headed. And so Hassan Agrada knows in the real world more than anyone about this. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dan, very much, and, and thank you for the invitation and great work you're doing here. You know, uh, I don't know why we're just beginning to talk about driveless cars when actually I would argue that driveless cars were on the road since they invented the cell phones. <laughs> Because most drivers before the law enacted were driving with their cell phones, and uh, it's as bad as driveless cars. But uh, I thank you, uh, Susie and John. They had some great, uh, great ideas, uh, great ideas about to think about. But, but let's just take a couple of history lessons. Uh, in the 1980s, at the time I was working for uh, Metro, which is the agency that built transportation projects for, for LA County. Carpool lanes were the answer to our problems. Let us just build a carpool lane in every freeway, and I think congestion, and, and we're gonna get people to ride. Here are some statistics. In 1980, mode split for carpoolers were 13.5% of total trips. In 1990, 14.1%. In 2000, 12.6%. Today, it's 11.6%. Transit. 1980, 2.5% of total trips. At one point, we decided to do it free. We jumped to 2.6. Today, it's 1.9. So obviously what we've been doing to change the behavior, and, and I think it's a little, changing behavior is difficult. But I want you to remember this phrase, and I will stand by it until I retire somewhere and nobody knows where I am. That I don't care how good of a planning you do, if the system is not priced right, you're not gonna do it. And our system is not priced right. It's, it's so screwed up in terms of one is, I think uh, Dr. John mentioned, people perception of the cost is different than what the cost is. Most people, in, at least in Southern California, would say the cost of my trip to LA when I compare taking the train or the car is filling the gas up. Not the insurance, not the appreciation of the car, none of that. And some people said, well, let us incentivize people to do different things. That's all great, but that's not going to solve it. At the end of the day, if every person getting in a car paid the full cost of that trip, they will probably be with aliens in the car to go somewhere else. Maybe. So we need to price the system right. I, I, I hope that this research is going to get into how do you price a system right and do the other stuff, incentivizing and changing the urban form so that people could, could, could actually get to a point where, okay, where are we going with all of this? I have no doubt that automation will be part of our lives in the next few years. I don't have a great deal of evidence, but I probably would say have no doubt that it will increase travel. Dan and I, 
few years back talk about Uber and Lyft. He called them maybe glorified taxi cab companies. I didn't disagree with him then. I didn't disagree with him today. I'm an example. I travel a lot. And I have not taken a taxi cab for the last three to four years. But I still took uh, an Uber. And sometimes actually probably took more Uber than I would take taxi because they're, they're available. So how we move Uber and Lyft from becoming a glorified taxi cab companies to becoming actually a, a mode where we could have less drivers on the road. So how do we get people to share you know, the, third, the third revolution? How do we get people to share the autonomous vehicle so we get somewhere? We need to price it right. And we need to give, you know, every, I think Susie mentioned data. And I told Dan earlier, everybody tells me, oh, we have this data and we have this data. And I say, okay, give me this information. Oh, I don't have it. So what's the point of the data? if it doesn't turn into information that add value to the subject we're talking about. Actually, uh, at SCAG in Southern California, and we're talking to UC Davis and UCLA and, and USC, we want to create probably the biggest big data center in the United States, maybe the world. We even have an international flavor. We're willing to put 20, 30 million dollars to do it because I believe information is not available to a lot of decision makers to make the right decisions. And, and, and I want to just come back to something that if we were serious about sustaining ourselves into the future, all the strategies that we've been working on without this, uh, uh, the added technology element hasn't been working to do what we intended to do. I mean, our goal was uh, originally start to get rid of congestion. We quickly realized that's impossible. And people get mad at me. I, I tell them, you know, we're never going to get rid of congestion in the LA region. Or best we could do is manage it. Or why is that? Well, you know, the later demand discussion. Uh, we built the 210 freeway. We just opened it five years ago. It became the worst freeway in two years of all the three east-west corridors in the Skag region. Congestion is getting so bad in the Skag region, it doesn't matter whether it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You know, how many of you are from Southern California? How many of you think that it matters what time you're on the road? It's, it's bad. It, it's really bad. Now, get back to this, and this is why I'm excited about the research, and I that is my hero, and, and I would support this research as long as I'm, I'm, I'm able to. We need to get to a point where we actually make sense out of the policies that we're trying to, to, uh, to, to move forward. Just simply by saying, let's incentivize people to share is not going to work. But let us so like we just did a stress test, the, the me me Metropolitan Planning Organization, the four large ones representing 85%, MTC, SACAG, SANDAG, and SCAG. And we tried to figure out what is the most we could get from, uh, by reducing greenhouse gas emission from strategies. By far, pricing was the only one that worked. We pushed the envelope in land use, we pushed the envelope in incentivizing, we pushed the envelope in transit. But when it comes to pricing, that's the most cost-effective strategy. Now, People, this is not popular. People said, like, ah, oh, I already paid for the system. Why should you price me again? You have to explain to the people that didn't pay a fraction of the cost of the system. How many people put in their calculation paying for the health cost that this pollution causes when we drive? And so I would hope, this is my hope, that at the end of this project, we at least understand where the faults are. And when it comes to the three revolution, they're real. We need autonomous vehicles to be shared autonomous vehicles. Because otherwise, we're going to have more vehicles and the picture, uh, you know, worth a thousand words. I'm going to conclude by this. I, I believe, I'm not surprised transit ridership is declining. Actually, it's declining significantly in Los Angeles area. In Orange County, it's down 30%. In LA, we're adding a lot of transit, and it's down 
six or seven percent, and I think it will continue. One, Dan mentioned the immigrants, but I also believe that if you want to have a working transit system, it has to be demand responsive, it has to be convenient, it has to do everything that an autonomous vehicle or an Uber will do. And I think we have some good news. I think Uber pool, a lift pool, combined with some good land use policies, maybe the state of California one day will will try to do what Governor Brown tried to do with the buy right, you know, to build houses so local elected officials don't have to face that political. So with that, I'll stop and, and we'll open it up for, for, for questions. Thank you. Okay, if you're not provoked by this topic, uh, it's hopeless. <laughs> because this is something we all deal with all the time. Of course, if we were in LA, we would probably be even more provoked, but. Um. All right, so let's open up the questions. We have a microphone here. Um, are we there? Okay, here she's closer. <laughs> Second. Well, I'll follow up on the question about the urban form uh -huh. and if we have more shared vehicles and um, um, shared rides of various kinds, what implications might that have in terms of being rolled out into um, local land use policies, building codes, parking requirements? Okay. Let me just start with this and maybe, maybe Susie and, and John will add. Let me start by saying there is only one entity right now in charge of land use, that local city government the five council members. 190 of them are in my region. They're members of my agency, they're my board. But I'm at the stage of my career, I don't care if they fire me. I will tell you this, they are actually becoming the problem of changing the urban form. Because if every city thinks that they're built out and they're perfect, and if you wanna do anything else, go to the next city. And Recently, I was at uh, Yosemite speaking to the local government commission, and, and one of the mayors in the Central Valley asked me a question. So, okay, you talk about autonomous vehicle. What should I do? I said, well, you should stop building parking structures. You should start building uh, places where you pick up and you drop off people. I'm telling you, he almost wanted to kill me. So, what do you mean? Well, I can't stop. I just promised my people. So, unless we change the way land use decisions are made, it's all just a discussion. And I feel like it does, you know, to me, getting to this future we want, it takes a full court press on every angle we have. And land use, of course, is an important angle to that. And I want to follow up on the pricing also. So I'm happy to hear you talk about pricing like that. The other thing I would say is that, you know, you can price in two forms. One is dollars and one is time. And we also need to think about the time component, giving priority of the infrastructure and of cities to people who are sharing, you know, rides, really, sharing rides, so. Thank you. Um, this is more of a comment than a question. Um, oftentimes when I hear conversations on automation, we focus a lot on the light duty vehicle sector, passenger vehicles. And I think, I know you mentioned goods movement, but I think it's yeah. really important when we're talking about transportation systems shared between goods movement and passenger that we think about automation together and how these things will all work together and demand and who gets what in terms of the available transportation um, infrastructure. So, thank you. Yeah, I agree. I would have liked to put, but I feel like I should have more freight stuff in. I just keep giving it as an afterthought. But this whole on-demand economy scares me, actually. It's, um, and all the drones in the air and the... <laughs> well, not, not if you have a 3D printer in your house, do everything for you. <laughs> do the chocolate and, you know. You still need to get the goods, yeah. the raw materials to the house, <laughs> yeah. But it is an illustration that automation can actually lead to this so-called hell scenario, Absolutely. dystopia, um, on freight side as well as on yeah. the passenger side. Yeah, hi, this is Mark with the Air Board. I have a question for Hassan. I've been hearing for decades now about pricing. I mean, pricing will solve everything. And usually economists love to latch on to this idea of pricing, whether it's a carbon tax, whether it's, it's congestion pricing, whether it's cordon pricing, whatever. I always hear pricing, pricing, pricing. But what I don't hear is, and I'd like your thoughts on it, is 
how do we address the equity issues with that? You know, we just heard presentations on social justice and equity, disadvantaged communities, and that's a huge issue for us sure. in California state government and, and at the Air Resources Board. So how do we make sure that if we implement pricing, we're not turning our publicly funded roadways essentially into um, mobility for the, you know, the upper class? Two things. Uh, I'm still not convinced, and maybe if these good people could convince me that pricing really does hurt the poor if you do it right. And uh, let me tell you why. We just two years ago opened two high occupancy toll lanes in our region, in the 10 freeway and on the 110. How many of you use those toll? Okay. Now, the f there were a lot of screaming about, oh my God, this is the Lexus lanes all over again, the one the Lexus land that we inherited from San Diego are coming to Los Angeles. And I, I, got, I got beaten so badly because I support these things. So what happened since then? We have actually actual data. What happened is those two lanes generated $40 million in the last two years, improved congestion on the mixed flow, and people who use them love them. And that $40 million got reinvested in the corridor for people to incentivize them to use transit and do other stuff. So I would argue you if you do it right and you reinvest whatever the toll procedure, whatever, in the corridor for the main goal of getting to a point where you have a sustainable transportation system, I think the poor will benefit as opposed to the perception the poor will get hurt. I will be against just arbitrarily saying, let us charge every lane without having an option available and without making sure that whatever we're doing is not going to make us go backward from the status quo. And, and so far, the data prove what I'm saying. We'll see what happened. Now, SCAG is doing, uh, uh, with a lot of partners, uh, we have uh, in RDC and UCLA working on cordon pricing and congestion pricing. We know that in London, it worked great because they have other choices to people. I think in places like downtown Los Angeles, it could work great. I think in places like downtown San Francisco, it could work great. Could it work everywhere? No. We just have to apply the right thing in the right place. Maybe. Yeah, you know, I would, one thing Hassan said that I'd emphasize is creating choice. The problem is people don't have choice. And once we create choice, then there's a lot more options. Poor, rich, everyone. And it creates the opportunities to provide first and last mile service to transit. It provides mechanisms for providing service to low income people. You know, it does mean transforming our transportation finance system, which we missed that opportunity uh, very recently here in Sacramento. But there's so much opportunity. And that's what this all is about, is we're creating now, this is different from the past. Right. And, and, and Dan, on the, on the equity issue, just 70% of total funding in our region comes from local sources called sales taxes. These are the most regressive yeah. way of collecting <laughs> transportation money. That hurts the poor, not, not the tolling the way we talk about it. So, I mean, there's a lot for us to learn from what we did and apply it to the future. Where's the microphone? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, this is Bill Dean from Kelly PA. You, you've talked about with <laughs> autonomous vehicles, there'd be more of them on the road, but if they're all connected to each other and they can travel closer to each other safely, even though there might be congestion, won't they be able to travel faster than the cars in congestion today? Well, there will be more capacity, so you can get more throughput, but again, if the demand is beyond the capacity, then you hit congestion. So the idea is, is that the, if we increase capacity now, sure, we can serve the demand today and have free flow, but the demand isn't going to stay as it is today. It's going to grow to push against that. Whatever capacity is built, the demand will grow. So This, this argument, though, I, I think this is an important point. I, I think we should not pour another inch of cubic concrete anywhere because because <laughs> connected vehicle actually technology could double triple quadruple the capacity we have today you know I, i'm an engineer so i'll go 
capacity is a function of speed and spacing. If you could control spacing, you add capacity. So if you want to build another freeway, just deploy technology. Having said that, we get back to, again, if you make it easier for us without doing other stuff and providing other choices, we're all going to be dry, uh, calling our own autonomous vehicle to come pick us up, and we'll have too many of them even for that added capacity. So it's, it's about policies that sustain itself into the future. I would also point out that those kind of improvements in capacity are probably quite a long ways off because yeah. before we get to all the cars on the road being automated, mm -hmm. we're going to have some time when there's various levels of mix and we won't, we won't be able to see that improved speed for, I think, some time. But that highlights the need for higher load factors in our cars and vans and so on. So, yes? Uh, hi, Mark Wenzel, Cali, PA, and I just wanted to offer a slightly more optimistic take on freight than Dan's hell scenario, uh, which is, uh, but following the same premise that a lot of these, uh, you know, freight delivery systems are going to be more on demand and more individualized, I think uh, one of the things that autonomous vehicles offers is the possibility for a redefinition of vehicle. Uh, so Yelp right now is testing a system in San Francisco where they deliver uh, takeout meals and essentially what are coolers on wheels. Uh, they are... Uh, autonomous vehicles that are driving on the sidewalks. Uh, so I think when it gets to the point where you say, uh, a instead of going, Alexa, add milk to my shopping list, Alexa, bring me some milk, and then this cooler shows up with what you need. Uh, in that case, uh, it, it does increase vehicle miles traveled, uh, but if you redefine the vehicle from being a big steel box with one person in it to a much smaller vehicle uh, without a person in it, then we also have to <clears throat> close that loop back from what a freight is to what a trip is and the kinds of trips that people are going to take. And you want to be walking down the sidewalk. I know. <laughs> 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 okay. Okay. It's Jester and Yeh, CEC. Um, continuing the, the super optimistic bent. <laughs> Supposing we get all the way there and we're all connected and we're all autonomous and we're all shared. Um, what do we? What models do you guys have to offer in terms of replacing parking revenue? Now that we don't need it. A well, voice pricing of to get there, you have to have pricing. I well, think. Well, that's that's why pricing is important, and this should be parking revenues and parking. Pri By the way, in the Skag region, this is statistic important. We have five and a half parking space per person. <laughs> okay, if you take the malls and all of that. Now, you tell me that's a good use of land. Uh, so, so this uh, pricing is a whole. Uh, by the way, you could come to downtown Los Angeles Park for $5 all day. That's ridiculous. Pricing has to be part of it, and the revenues has to <laughs> be part of that. It is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, Hi, um, I wanted to add to Hassan's response about how to handle pricing equitably, um, but first endorse that pricing is central to the future of transportation, regardless of the vehicles we travel on, if we're going to find a way to finance our infrastructure. Um, my name is Jane Lapp, and I used to work for the Volpe Center, which is a US DOT research institute where we had responsibility for evaluating the impact of LA's pricing program. And along the corridor, I believe it was the San Bernardino corridor, there was a trial for people who took transit. Right. They earned credits right. that they could then use sure. um, on pricing. And so mm -hmm. that's another way to equitably sure. distribute um, for pricing. Sure, absolutely. So pricing is time or money. Uh, people need fitness, so often they, people drive to the gym. Um, <laughs> active transportation can eliminate a lot of that need uh, for, and, and gain public health. So alternative modes for safe, short trips is important. Um, what policies lead to facilitate this? Uh, and in my autonomous journey, I had my bicycle with me. <laughs> if, I were, if I were to uh, be designing a new city, I'll do everything you said. 
but our problem is we, we have a, an urban form that we're going to have to make work. And to do all this, to go to the gym walking from your house or biking or using transit, you have to have options that are not available today. Now, can we still do something within the urban form? Yes. Is it difficult to do it statewide? Absolutely. It's very difficult because in some places there is no choices. Um, I'm Jeff, an advocate, and I will talk about Sepulveda 405 in Wilshire for the many years from 60 forward to seeing what that intersection is like and as you talk about it. But public policy went this year to the STA when the previous director was there and showed that Berkeley used a magnetic levitation, shall we say, mechanism for bus transportation, giving an automated or autonomous level for returning destination. Much like your San Fernando, um, should we say, I think it's uh, Universal City to Warner Center. But the interesting part was they could not do that in California because policy in California would not allow that type of testing with the driver. So it was done up, I believe, in Washington. And what I think of the other one of the most efficient system that I've heard or seen is what goes on in Washington, D.C., where you do a various shared writing and other things picking up at various points. Just curious how well that model has been observed. How's that promoted? <laughs> No, you, <laughs> you know, I, if I understood you, your your question correctly, look, uh, even if California allowed the testing, and even if we have magnetic levitation, if when we have a high speed rail that magnetically levitated and done, that's not going to change what we're talking about. No, I'm just talking about yeah. for a bus that they did that so they uh, every time frankly, I I told Dan earlier, uh, fixed route transit is a good thing. But it's not gonna it's not gonna change the mode split from one point nine percent to fifty percent. Maybe change it to two point one. But that's not what we need. So th these are all good things and, and they, they contribute to the system, but the solution is, is gonna have to be much bigger. Much bigger. Okay, uh, last <coughs> this is the last question here and then oh, we're perfect. Into it. <laughs> <laughs> My name is uh, Dustin Foster, I work for Caltrans. Um, I'm going to be a bit critical, actually. Um, I think when we think about the three revolutions, certainly they will. You know, it's, it's probably fair to, to assume that they'll uh, help with congestion. Um, it's probably fair to assume they'll also probably help with uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But you know, I often uh, wonder whether they'll help in uh, certainly helping other more, in my opinion, relevant goals that are statewide of increasing multimodal trips and reducing VMT. Um, so certainly I think I agree with some of the things that um, two of the, oh, it's Susan and Joan said, about, um, you know, about ensuring that the, the capacity increase and make sure we, we actually share the trips. And uh, we, you know, we certainly have to go uh, away from a model of, of car ownership. Um, so that's personally, uh, that's why I would always prefer a, a public transit trip or walking and biking to uh, car share, uh, ride sharing. Um, so. Uh, I kind of have a question, also a recommendation. Um, I've done a lot of research on the safety aspects of uh, these three revolutions, and um, I'm sure a lot, maybe some of you have heard about the, the trolley problem, where uh, you know someone has to choose, uh, a, tro a trolley's coming down, it's gonna go, there's people tied to one track, and he's standing on the other track, and he has to choose or the trolley is going to go on the track, which would hurt the people, you know, kill the people, uh, on the one uh, track versus killing himself. And I think there's a real issue uh, in terms of active transportation. Cyclists and, and uh, walkers are most vulnerable road users. Um, you know, whether or not these systems, whether or not these, uh, these, uh, you know, these automated vehicles are going to be programmed uh, to protect our road's most vulnerable users. So I would recommend um, a modal hierarchy system where we prioritize on our roads the most vulnerable users. So pedestrians first, cyclists second, uh, you know, and then other vehicles below. Uh, so are there any comments, uh, feedback on that concept? Let me, let me I'll, I'll jump in and say that. Um, first of all, if you really automate the vehicles, 
uh, robots, they don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't text. Uh, almost by definition, they're going to be safer, the, you know, with the technology improving. So it's really a question of how much safer and how. And there is lots of effort going into dealing with uh, pedestrians. So um, I think w w this is another example of we have opportunities to do it much better. There's lots of questions along the path, as we've highlighted here today. And that's kind of why we want to engage all of you uh, in that discussion, in that process, because lots of decisions are going to be made along the way, both in the private sector and the public sector. And this is such an important time. So thank you all for coming, and thank you all for participating. Good to see you, John. Yeah, nice I, to see I, you. I remember we see a lay.